Jeremiah 29. I want us to talk today about a prayer for the city. Today we are three weeks into our 40 days of prayer for the city of Pensacola. And I would like us to consider this because it seems the city is not a well-liked place among most Christian circles. I can think of three local churches, two from our own denomination in our own association here, in the past few years that have either closed down or tried to physically move the location of the church because they did not like the neighborhood they were in. Because it was a bad neighborhood in the city. In other words, their ministry methodology, why they were at their church and how they operated, was what we would call attractional rather than incarnational. They were trying to bring people in with events rather than going out and loving the neighborhood that God had placed them in. The morals of those living around them were not what they wanted in their church. And so, they tried to sell the property and leave rather than change the situation around them as salt and light. That's a problem. To be very blunt, they would rather have their suits and ties and listen to southern gospel music than go out and be authentic disciples loving the community around them to faith in Jesus Christ. We can enter into the culture without losing our Christian distinctiveness. But the 50s does not equal Christianity. Because Christianity in the 50s looks a lot differently than Christianity in the time of the apostles. And I don't want to go back to the 50s as my ministry methodology. I want to go back to Scripture. And see what God has said about how we reach the people around us. And what Jesus has said is we are to be a community of faith. We are to be salt and light. And salt doesn't do anything until you put it on the food. Light doesn't do anything. You can't even tell there's light until there's darkness around it. So if a church is trying to escape from the city, and escape instead of entering in it and flooding it with the truth and the love of Christ, nothing will ever be accomplished. Let's be real honest this morning and consider the situation here in Pensacola. It is not easy in the flesh to love what has been going on in our city. According to the Crime Index in 2009, Pensacola, listen to this, this blew me away. Pensacola is only statistically safer than 7% of the cities in the USA. Statistically, we are only safer than 7% of the cities in our country. 2009, 344 aggravated assaults, 6 cases of arson, 626 cases of burglary, 25 forcible rapes, 2,026 cases of larceny and theft, 115 motor vehicle thefts, 3 murders and manslaughters, 99 robberies, 2,773 property crimes, 471 violent crimes. That's bad. The city violent crime rate for Pensacola in 2009 was higher than the national violent crime rate average by 104.74% in Pensacola. By the way, they don't put that on the brochures when they welcome you to the city. But you know what? Shame on the church for not talking about it and not caring about it and not wanting to be the salt and light that Jesus has called us to be. It's easy to dismiss the city, to hate the city, to say it's nothing but a cesspool of lowlifes, to ignore it. And this has been the approach by many. I have heard pastors, as well as Christians in the pews, say they would rather go and hide in the woods and be a recluse than deal with the people of the city. And this is nothing new. The cities of this country have always been dens of sin and pockets of corruption. Go back to the beginning of this country, Thomas Jefferson. He said the cities are pestilential to the morals, the health, and the liberties of men. Pestilential. That's not a very good, very pretty word, is it? Talking about the cities. But you know what? Jefferson, in a sense, was right. The cities have challenges. But to be real straight with you today, it is sinful to hate, to disregard, or to ignore the city that God has called us to. It is unbiblical in the highest degree because God cares for the city. God cares for the hopeless. If we look at statistics today, half of the world's population now lives in a city. And the figure will rise to 80% by the middle of this century. In other words, if we hate the city and we ignore the city, we're saying right now that half of the world can go to hell and we're okay with it. And we have no problem with it at all. 
We need to be His arms in the worst of places because Jesus didn't just come to save people that like Southern Gospel music. He came to save sinners. People that are struggling and hurting in this world. We see violence and prostitution and abandoned buildings, racial dividing lines, the slow shuffle of the poor, great buildings built for human pride, and we realize the city needs Jesus Christ. But do we care? Now, to Jeremiah chapter 29, if you've turned there. We're going to talk today about the city of Babylon. And here's the facts. If you lived in the city of Babylon which we consider today, you would have been tempted not only to agree with President Jefferson and the attitudes of many Christians, you probably would have wanted to flee the city. But God does not agree. Man says the city does not have a prayer. It does not have a chance to change. And God says, and the truth is, Pensacola does have a prayer. We have a duty as Christians. So hear with me what God told the prophet Jeremiah about what we are to pray and do for our city. Churches can be in the city, they can be against the city, they can be of the city, or they can be for the city. Today, we need to be challenged to be for the city. Hear with me God's Word. Jeremiah 29. Now, these are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the remainder of the elders who were carried away captive, to the priests, to the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had carried away captive from Jerusalem to Babylon. Here's the historical context. This happened after Jeconiah the king, the queen mother, the eunuchs, the princes of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen, the smiths, the the artisans, really, they had been departed from Jerusalem. The letter was sent by the hand of Elsa, the son of Shaphan, and Gomariah, the son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon, to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, saying, here's the letter, ready? Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all who were carried away captive, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon, city of Babylon, build houses and dwell in them, plant gardens and eat their fruit, take wives and beget sons and daughters, take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands, so that they may bear sons and daughters, that you may be increased there and not diminished. And seek the peace, in Hebrew, seek the shalom of the city where I have caused you to be carried away captive. And pray to the Lord for it. For in its peace, in its shalom, you will have peace. Look at verse 11. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace, thoughts of shalom, and not of evil. To give you a future, and to give you a hope. Let us pray. Our God, still us right now. And change our hearts, break our hearts, so that we would love the city you have called us to, you have placed us in. It is not by chance that Klondike Baptist Church is in Pensacola, Florida, in Escambia County. It is not by chance that you have called us all from different parts of this country to be at this place to worship you today. It's not by chance that some of us here were born in this place. This has been our home from our births. And God, we can do two things. We can rebel against your will, or we can find joy in serving you and see you change things. Oh God, I pray that would be our heart's desire. And Lord, that this church would stop thinking small, and instead would think the power of God and what you can do, because with you all things are possible. Oh Lord, open heaven's gates and flood us with your Spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. And God's children said, This was a letter sent to all the Jewish people that had been exiled to Babylon, probably 597 B.C. The Babylonians did terrible things to the Jews. We want to talk about racial reconciliation. Jews and Babylonians didn't like one another. You've got to understand, when the Babylonians came into Israel, they destroyed the beloved city of Jerusalem. They broke down their walls. They ransacked the temple. They destroyed the economy. They enslaved the people. They killed thousands. And we read here the words of Jeremiah. There was nothing Jeremiah could do physically to stop it. Nothing at all. But you know, there's an application right when we start reading these words. Jeremiah does do something. He begins by writing a letter to these people. You know, we may serve God and do good to our friends, do good to those that are at a distance by 
writing to them letters of comfort, letters of encouragement and counsel and blessing and praying for them. Those we can't speak to face to face, we can write to. We can care about from afar and pray for. Jeremiah does this, and you notice who he writes to. First off, he writes to the surviving elders. When Nebuchadnezzar came in 597 B.C., he either killed off many of the elders, the leaders, or he deported them. And so there was no elders left in Jerusalem. They were all taken away. Why? To stop the possibility of a revolt, of an insurrection among the Jews. Get rid of the leaders. The Jews left in Jerusalem won't have a chance to fight. And then... To the prophets. Now, when we read the Old Testament, in this era, there's only one prophet we know of that was carried away captive that was true. And that was Ezekiel. But they were false prophets galore. Just like there's a lot of false teachers today, and even false Christians who say that God hates the city and we should run from it. And run from the challenges that are before us. And then he says, I'm writing as well to the people, high and low, rich and poor, to the person in the pew. To the person who's never frequented a church in their life, everyone this letter is written to who is a believer. 29.2, the historical context. This happens after Jeconiah, the king of Judah, was deported. Zedekiah became his successor. Jeconiah, his mother, the queen, the eunuchs, the royal servants and officials, even the craftsmen and metal workers, the artisans. Nebuchadnezzar took them all from their home and deported them to his foreign land to the wicked city of Babylon. He did this so the Jews in Israel would be deprived of all their workers that could assist in fortifying the city, who could provide them with military weapons. Nebuchadnezzar left them hopeless in Jerusalem. He took them all away from their homes to his country. And then verse 3 tells us one more little historical detail before we get into the heart of this message. It tells us that Zedekiah, who was left in Jeconiah's place, sent this envoy to Babylon. And when he did this, Jeremiah sent the letter to go forward to talk to the people who had been displaced, who were hurting, who felt lost in the big city of Babylon. Now I'm sure Zedekiah sent these servants to pay tribute and to promise submission to the Babylonian king, but God had lessons for the people. And I'm thankful because they're lessons for us today. And I think the first thing we see in verses 4 through 7 is God is saying, To the people in Babel on this, he is saying, establish a presence in the city. Verses 4 through 7. Let me ask you a question. If Klondike Baptist Church closed its doors tomorrow, would the city even know we were gone? Who would know we were gone if we closed our doors tomorrow? According to verses 4 through 7, we are to have a presence in the city. But if we have no presence and we have no reach, they wouldn't care if we left. Let me ask you another question. If you left this city tomorrow, would anyone know that you are gone? Would anyone even care if you left this place? If you love a place, you have to establish a presence. Your family would know if you left because you have a presence with them. You care about them. You spend time with them. And here's the question. Would the city know? Would the city care at all? Read the verses with me again. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel... Read that. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles who I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses, live in them, plant gardens, eat their produce, take wives, have sons and daughters, take wives for your sons, give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters, multiply there, do not decrease. Don't lose your influence, grow your influence. I want you to notice God starts this letter off. He says, I am the Lord of hosts. I am the Lord of armies. That's the commencement. You may be in captivity to the Babylonian army, but I'm the God of all armies. I'm the God of the enemy. God is greater than the enemy of Klondike Baptist Church. He is greater than the enemies of Pensacola, Florida. You know, it is not always easy to live or work or worship or serve in the city God has called us to. Back in the 19th century, the Reverend John Todd warned about the city of Philadelphia, he said, Let no man who values his soul or his body ever go into a great city to become a pastor. Because the sin was so bad in Philadelphia then. I'd hate to see what he said about Philadelphia today. But you know what the facts of the matter is? That is sinful. And that's the opposite of what God tells Jeremiah to tell the people. Go and establish a presence. Make a footprint in the city. Change things for the better. God is the Lord of hosts. 
lost, it doesn't matter how bad the city looks. God's army's greater. With God, all things are possible. Amen? Some of us sit here glazed eyed Sunday after Sunday, and we don't think God can do anything. But I believe He can turn the city around when Christians get on their knees and then get off their knees and get to action. Establish a presence in the city. He is able to help us and deliver us. He's still the God of Israel. He's still the God of Klondike. Even when we failed in the past, you know, I pray that one day we have a homecoming. And it's not a homecoming where people come to eat. It's a homecoming because people come to Klondike Baptist Church because they want to see the church planners that were sent off from this church to start other churches. They want to see them come back and rejoice in what God's doing. I want to have a homecoming because we'll have a missionary coming from overseas in some city that we couldn't go to, but their heart was called and they went and did what God told them to do. That's what I want to see happen. A church that actually makes a difference and that establishes a presence. God has not abandoned us. He has not disinherited us. He hasn't disinherited Israel even though He's displeased with them and has corrected them. He's given them a big old spanking here and sent them to Babylon, but He's not done with them. He is still the God of hosts. He says, I sent you into exile. God has you where He wants you. You can either fight against the city, make fun of the city, or you can love it like God does. And that's what you need to consider today. Yes, their sins, their iniquities sent them to Babylon. But Nebuchadnezzar and his army, they were just instruments. They would have had no chance unless God was correcting His people. Amos 3.6 says it this way, Does disaster come to a city unless the Lord has done it? So here's what we have to answer today. If God sent us to Pensacola, like God sent Israel to Babylon, what should God's people do when they have a Babylonian zip code? What should God's people do when their zip code is 32526? And their mailing address is Pensacola, Florida. It's tempting to retreat. It's tempting to withdraw. It's tempting to get into a holy huddle and just be the little fragment of this thing they call the church where we just spoil one another and don't care about anyone else. That's easy to do. And you know, Israel had every reason to do that. They had every reason to hate the Babylonians. They had destroyed their city, killed their friends and family members, and enslaved them. They wanted God to free them, to start a revolution and get them out of there. But here's God's surprising plan. What do we do when we have a 32526 zip code, a Pensacola zip code? What do you do when you have a Babylonian zip code? You are to build the city of God right in the middle of the city of man. You are to build the city of God where the city is only 7% safer than the other cities in this country. You are called to this place. You are here for a reason. We can either find joy in that or we can fight God. But either way, God's plan will go forward. Phil Riken has said these words here. He said, God's plan is not to rescue us from the world, but to rescue us from sin and then send us into the world to be His servants. We're not called to have holy huddles. We're called to be the church. And until God turns that light bulb on, we will just float. I thank God we have a presence at Waterfront. We have a presence at NLO. But how much more we should be doing not because of a guilt trip, but because we find joy in loving others like Jesus does. Because we want to have a presence. Look what he says here. Build houses and live in them. By the way, that was in direct opposition to what the false prophet said in chapter 28. There's a guy named Hananiah in 28.4. He said, you're not going to be in Israel long. You're going to be returned and God's going to break the yoke of the king of Babylon. And God says, no, no, no. Don't listen to these false prophets. You are called to the city. I want you to build houses and live in them. Don't run from it. You know, we are supposed to pray for our neighborhoods and love the neighborhoods we're called to, even if they're not so nice. The exiles were not committed to doing God's work in God's city. So first God had to have them realize, this is your home. Settle down. Rejoice in it. The Lord doesn't just call people to jobs and spouses. He calls us to the place we live. God could have had you born in China if He wanted to. God could have had you born in the city of Philadelphia. He chose to have you here. God could have had your job lead you to some other place, but He chose to have you here. Don't you think you're a one-time Yankee pastor born in Baltimore, Maryland, wonder for a while why God has him in Pensacola? And I kicked against it for a while until I realized it's because God wants me here. And God wants you here. 
You know, wherever you are, the Bible says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So wherever a child of God goes, you're not off your father's ground. You're home. You are here. Plant gardens and eat produce. In other words, get involved in business. We should care about the economic status of Pensacola. We should vote wisely so that things improve. We should want people to have jobs. We should help people to have jobs. All of Baptist Church has started this wonderful thing, this wonderful ministry. I'm going to have them come talk about it in our church, where they're helping people get job skills and resume skills and helping people to be able to get into the workforce and get a job on their own and support themselves with the grace of God. And it's working. We need to do things like that. We need to care about people, care about their welfare. He continues, take wives and have sons and daughters. You know, you can serve God by having a believing family. And the most important thing a Christian can do, a Christian parent can do in their lifetime is to raise children who love Jesus. That's a wonderful thing. You know, we are supposed to be raising the next generation for Jesus Christ. What a blessing it would be to have Christians from Klondike Baptist Church as God grows this place, not because we want numbers, but because we want to do His work. If we had a Christian from Klondike Baptist Church on every street in this city who loved their city, loved their street, prayed for their neighbors, and was a real Christian to their neighbors. Could you imagine the footprint Klondike Baptist Church, and more importantly, the glory of God would have on this city? What God would do through us if we loved our neighborhoods and had concerns for our community and developed strategies to touch the neighborhoods we were in, had Bible studies in our homes, had Bible studies at Starbucks, had them at the library, wherever people were, we were there because we were a part of the city. We weren't just hiding and doing our own thing. We cared enough. You know, our church should have people from all ages, and we're working on that. But the fact of the matter is it should have people from all ages so we can reach all ages. Because the church is multi-generational. The church is not for 20-year-olds and it's not for 90-year-olds. It's for everybody. The gospel is for all. So number one, establish a presence in the city. And then the prayer, very clearly in verse 7. Seek the presence of the city. Pray for the prosperity of the city. Look what he says here. Seek the welfare. Seek the peace of the city where I have sent you into exile. Pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. Seek the welfare. You know what? You're not in exile in Pensacola. We've got to change our mindset. Too many of us think we're exiled here. I talk to young people a lot. You know what they say? I can't wait till I graduate college and get out of this city. I hear people say that like they're, they're enslaved here. You know, I've said those words a few times. I wish things would change, or I'd just like to get out of here. Years ago, when I first came here, I was so disappointed in the way things were going in so many ways. I'll just be honest with you. It's like we're exiled here, and we just we can't escape from this place. And the fact of the matter is, we are not exiles. We are missionaries where God has us. We are to seek the welfare of the city God has called us to. God's blessing and the good of the place we are. The word here for welfare or peace is the Hebrew word shalom. Seek the shalom of the city. Its shalom is your shalom. In other words here, think about this. We have heard in Psalms 122.6, a prayer of the Jews, David gave, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They will prosper that love you. And the Jewish people have been praying for Jerusalem for years, since David's day. And the word peace there is the word shalom. Oh God, we pray for the shalom of Jerusalem. Total peace. Perfect peace. We pray for the Prince of Peace to come down. They've heard that. They've been praying that prayer for years. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And now God is saying, wait a minute, pray for the shalom of Babylon. And God is saying to us today, pray for the shalom of Pensacola. Pray for the peace of God to come upon it. Shalom is a comprehensive term. Now I want you to understand today, it means order. It means health. It means safety. It means harmony, well-being, happiness, wholeness, completeness. Shalom means all is right within the city. Now let me ask you a question. When I start off the sermon and I read those statistics, did it sound very shalom-like to you? Did those crimes, did the pain of Pensacola sound very shalom-like? Are many Christians trying to further the shalom of the city? Or are we just trying to further the shalom of our little building? Let's apply this today. How do we pray for the shalom of the city? How do we seek the welfare of the city? 
Shalom. Total peace means, number one, we start by praying for everything that happens around us. The schools of the city. Every time you drive by a school, you should pray for it. Pray for teachers. Eight hours a day to influence the worldview of the next generation. You know, they're being battered in our schools. They're cursed at right to their faces and some of them can't do anything about it. Those people need our prayers and our love. They need our support. We need to pray for God's wisdom and safety and protection and boldness to do what is right no matter what the ACLU says. We need to pray for our schools. That God would change things. I talked to a student in one of our schools recently. He told me that basically there's open prostitution in his public school. That's essentially what goes on there. And I'm not going to get graphic this morning. Do you understand the dire need for the shalom of God to come upon our school system? I heard about Heritage Baptist Church, a good church in our town. The pastor there is a good man of God. He led his church to go to Ensley Elementary School. I think that's the name of it. And you know what they did? They bought shoes for every poor child and gave them shoes. That's seeking the shalom of those kids. Most of those kids' can't, parents can't even afford shoes. And now they have a bridge that has been crossed, a relationship that is now open. Because people are going to say, Heritage Baptist Church cares about the feet of our children. You know, if they care about the feet of our children, they may care about the souls of our children too. The welfare of our children and our families that are divorced and suffering. We need to pray for our schools and help our schools. What about the hospitals? Those who are devoted their lives to help the sick. Most Christians run from hospitals. We don't want to visit the sick. We don't want to be kind to the... You know, doctors live stressful lives. Some of you think, well, they deserve it, all the money they make. No, that's the wrong attitude. We need to encourage doctors, love doctors, pray for nurses that get overworked and underpaid. We need to love these people and pray for them. We need, instead of complaining that Sacred Heart owns half of the block there down the road, we need to thank God that He's furthering a good hospital. And pray for it. And pray for the other hospitals in town. I'm not just signaling out sacred art. All of them. Pray because that's important. The health of people is important to God. We still believe God heals people, don't we? And we also believe God has physicians. Luke, the beloved physician. I mean, we need to pray. We need to pray for homeless ministries, for the least of these that they would be cared for. You know, our heart needs to get bigger on that. I mean, that's all we talk about around here sometimes. And the fact of the matter is we keep talking about it because some of you aren't committed yet. And we need you to step out and do it. For families, that they would be strengthened and made whole. Marriage was the first institution God gave. And I'm not even going to begin to start telling you the divorce statistics in our county. And the pain that children are going through. And I'm not pointing the finger at anyone. God heals people that go through divorces. Praise God. He heals people that do that. He restores them wholly. Thank you God for that. But the fact is, where we're at now, we've got to change things. We can't change the past, but we can change the future. Pray for families. When you see that family across the street from you, you don't know what's going on, pray for them. Pray for God's shalom upon them. When you see a family in the church who's visited, pray for God's shalom. When you go downtown and you walk the street and you're praying for the street you're walking on, pray for that family that walks past you. Ask God to do something. We need to pray for churches, that churches would not just be in the city, that they would not be against the city like so many are, that they would not just be of the city, but that they would be for the city and love Jesus passionately enough to get out of their comfort zone and go do something. And be light and salt. I said it earlier, salt does nothing until you put it on the food. It's worthless until you do something with it. Light, you can't tell there's light in this sanctuary because there's plenty of lights. If you shut all the lights off and you turn one on, then the light stands out. And until the light gets into the darkness, you don't see the light. You just are there and existing. And too many of us are just existing. Pray and love as the church. Our government wisdom and God's hands on our rulers as the leaders go and the, the moral state of the leaders goes to the state of the country and so goes the state of the city. Even if you disagree with them, you need to pray for them and love them. We need to pray for our neighborhoods, that they would again be safe places where you can walk and talk to your neighbors and not fear. You know, I walk, I was walking every single day for a year straight. I've been bad the last couple weeks, I've been too busy. But I was. And let me tell you something. There's times where people just don't even want to look at you in the face. And I say hi to them and they mumble under their breath something that I probably don't want to know what they said. And a lot of them don't even know I'm a preacher. They don't know that. They don't know who I am. You know, God can change that. 
maybe I need to not just walk, but stop and just harass them with love. I don't, I don't know how to do that, but I've got to figure that out. Would you pray with me? Pray with me that we would be better at that. We need to love it. That's why we said instead of just spending money on Christmas to, to give fruit baskets out, we spent money to give out New Testaments. And I hope you did walk your neighborhood and put them on doors and talk to people. We need to pray for the crime that the God who neither slumbers nor sleeps, all oh, that He would bring His conviction down. And that when people have heard the word, when they're going to do the act, that God would convict them. And that they would stop so our children would have a safe place, a place of shalom to live and grow. We need to pray for economic progress, not just for rich men to get richer, even though that's not a bad thing, if they're using their money for good. We need to pray that the rich do get richer if they're going to use it for good and invest it back into their city and invest it into the work of the kingdom. And we need to pray for the poor that they could get a job. We need to care about the economy. Let me tell you something, friends. We need to pray for the economics of this place. Because if you don't have a job, your life gets hard. You get desperate. Thank God if you do have one. We need to pray for racial reconciliation so all neighborhoods can be places where it doesn't matter what color you are. You can walk down it and no one looks down at you. You don't have to fear because of what color you are because everyone knows it's not about your skin, it's about the heart. Oh God, change that. This city could be beautiful if there was racial reconciliation. Instead, it's a burden right now. People are afraid to go to this part of town, afraid to go to that part of town. We need to pray for immigrants who are coming to our city seeking refuge. There's populations of different people in this city, obviously, that are coming. And they need the love of Christ. They don't need the Buddhism they've been following. They don't need to be burdens to us. They need to be a blessing to the city. Good missionaries pray for the city. This is a foretaste of what Jesus said in Matthew 5. I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That's what we're to be doing. God loves messed up cities and we should too. Amen? Amen. Seeking the peace of the city means being a good neighbor. It means obeying the law. It means picking up trash. It means planting a tree. It means feeding the poor. It means volunteering at a local school. It means greeting people at the store. It means driving safely and helping people with car trouble on the side of the road. It means embracing people from every ethnic background with the love of Christ. It means going to the people on your street and letting them know you're there for them. And they can come to you if they want to borrow an egg or if they need prayer. It means doing good work on the job for the sake of the people who are being served and for the glory of God. Just as every passenger is concerned, if you're in an airplane for the safety of the airplane, or if you're out on sea on a ship and for the safety of the ship, the fact is we are on the ship whether we like it or not. And we need to have that kind of concern. Another example of this is John Calvin. His gospel ministry did so much good for the city of Geneva, not just spiritually, but medicinally, socially, economically, educationally. Calvin said these words. He said, God has filled my mind with His zeal to spread His kingdom and to further the public good, to bring the shalom to the city. And Calvin did. He started hospitals and schools and reached out to the poor and promoted the practice of sound business. He even helped clean up the city streets by designing an, the, by designing an urban sewer system, which is much like what we have today. You know, I think of even in our association, one of the most wonderful ministries, and I'm praying now, God, grow our church for one of the reasons is so we have more money to support this ministry. It's the Health and Hope Clinic. Since 2003, it's a clinic started out by the Pensacola Bay Baptist Association, one of the biggest success stories. Since 2003, the clinic has provided $8,500,000 in health care services and 12,000 patient provider visits. Just in 2010, they had 1,900 patient visits provided medical services valued at $1,322,121. And they did it all on a budget of $50,000. $1,322,000 of medical care on a budget for $50,000. Imagine if Little Poor Clinic Baptist Church could scrum up another $1,000. What could they do with $51,000? Amazing. That's what we're talking about. Volunteers donated over 15,000 hours of service and saw 19 patients receive Jesus Christ as Lord. That's loving the city and saying, we're going to change things and we're going to do our best and let God provide, and He does. A city, a church for a city is willing to dream big. 
and take scary risk for the great God we serve because He has begun a great work here and He will do it through the church for the city that He wants to bless so desperately. Today, all these things are great. They're wonderful. We should pray for these things. We should want these things. But here's the fact of the matter. Seeking the presence and the peace of God on the city is something, yes, we do as Christians. It's just we do as a church. But we must realize that we can do all those things. We can feed the poor and invite homeless guests to our church for dinner and have blood drives like we've done in the past and we're going to do soon and lead Bible studies in public. We can do all these things and fail to bring the real shalom if we don't bring Jesus Christ. We have been justified by faith, Romans 5.1, and because of that we have peace with God. We have shalom with God. This city is such a mess because we are enemies of God. There is no shalom. And until we start caring for the whole shalom of the city, we will not see people reconciled to God. When we talk about the city, we're not just talking about a line on a map or a group of people who pay a certain wage tax. We're not talking about people just like you, but everything and everyone created in the image of God that makes up the culture of Pensacola. So here's how I want to close this out. I want you to pray for the county commissioner you don't like. I want you to pray for the ethnic group that's hurt your feelings in the past. I want you to pray for the deputy that saved your life and for the sheriff you voted against in the last election. I want you to pray for the employee at Hardee's that took way too long to get your food. And for the person who is at McDonald's every morning getting that dollar cup of coffee because that's all they can afford. I want you to pray for the mayor that you like and the corrupt politician you can't stand. I want you to pray for the people in Brownsville and Warrington where we're going to be going this year again to reach out. Many of you can't relate to the people of Brownsville and Warrington except for this. We are the same. We are sinners in need of a Savior. And then we relate totally. Pray unto the Lord for it. First Timothy 2, I pray, I urge you first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings, for all in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful life, a shalom life, a quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. I want to end this with verse 11. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare, not for evil. Plans to give you a future and a hope. This is one of the most out of context verses in all of Scripture. Taken out of context over and over again. One of the most taken out of context because it's always used for high school graduations and birthdays and cards. You've seen it there, right? Robert Linthicum wrote a book entitled God, City of God, City of Satan, A Biblical Theology of the Urban Church. This is what he said. He said, recently I noticed a rather intriguing plaque hanging on the wall. The photograph was any camera buff stream. Pine trees near the foreground framing the picture. A crystal clear lake mid-scene. In the background, a majestic snow-capped mountain against a cloudless sky. Across that plaque was inscribed the golden promise from Scripture. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. A magnificent biblical promise. One of my favorite promises of Scripture. But that promise was not made among pine trees and crystal clear lakes and snow-capped mountains. Instead, this was a promise made in a city, a wicked city, and a promise given to an urban people of God. It's an urban promise. Stop writing that on birthday cards and pray it for the city. Jeremiah says, God is speaking here. I know. I alone. Not the false prophets. Not churches that tell you to flee the city. I know the plans I have for you. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. Your captivity is for your good. Your living in Pensacola is for the shalom of your life in the city. Even that which seems to be evil is designed for good. We must have patience till the fruit is ripe and we can eat it. But it's going to get ripe if God's people do God's work God's way. And they will never lack God's supply. Peace, shalom, Babylon, shalom, Pensacola, shalom, your shalom, to give you an expected end, a future, and a hope. The nation of Israel will not come to an end. Their exile will come to an end. They will be restored. Will you pray for Pensacola in the name of Jesus? Will you love Pensacola like Jesus does? Will you weep over Pensacola like Jesus? Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Oh, Pensacola, Pensacola, how I would have gathered you. But you were not willing. Will you pray for shalom over the city? And then will you get up and make it happen?
Here's what I'm going to close with. How are you going to change the schools? You come. You tell me and I'll support you. I will support you as a pastor 100%. Get an idea and let's do it. How will we change the hospitals? How will we change the homeless? How will we change families? Let me give you an example of that. Chris West came up to me and said, we need to have a marriage Saturday. Just commit it. We come hang out, eat a meal, have different people talk about marriage. That's how we're going to change families. You give me your idea, we'll do it. How are we going to change the government? How are we going to change churches? How are we going to change neighborhoods? How are we going to change crimes? How are we going to change the economic progress? How are we going to change the racial reconciliation? Ask God to open your heart and give you the answer. Because I don't have a monopoly on it, and I don't have the wisdom, but God does. God, use us all in this. Let's pray. Lord, our hearts need to be where your heart is. God, our hearts need to be for the shalom of the city. I pray you've changed us today. I pray you've opened our ears, opened our eyes, opened our hearts. God, like never before, we would be the church. May we be resolved. And God, I pray you give ideas to my friends and my church family here. So we can be the church of the city. For the city. Bless each one. May your shalom come upon each one as we seek to do this. We pray in Jesus' name. And God's people said.
is Joshua Walno for pastor of Klondike Baptist. And I want to thank you for taking the time to listen to this sermon today. If we can be of any help to you, answer any questions about the Bible, or talk more with you about the salvation provided by the mighty hand of Christ Jesus, feel free to contact us by any of the methods mentioned on our church website. If you would like to share a testimony of how God's Word has transformed your life, please write and let us know. We'd love to hear from you. And remember, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone pluck them out of my hand.